This is going to be an overview of the book of Jeremiah. This book has 52 chapters, 1,364 verses, and around 42,694 words. So it's a pretty big book. Jeremiah is one of the rougher characters in the Bible. And Matthew 2.17 shows us that the author is Jeremiah. And in Matthew 16.14, isn't it something that the Lord Jesus Christ was compared to Jeremiah in the New Testament? And some people said that he was Jeremiah. This goes to show that Jesus himself is a rough character and not the soft, effeminate one that people make him out to be. But... Something interesting about Jeremiah is that he is commanded not to marry. In Jeremiah 16, 1 and 2, it says, The word of the Lord came also unto me, saying, Thou shalt not take thee a wife, neither shalt thou have sons or daughters in this place. This would have given Jeremiah more time to spend with the Lord. The fact that he didn't get married. Because in 1 Corinthians seven thirty three, it says, But he that is married careth for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. It's a good to marry. It's a good thing to marry. Proverbs eighteen twenty two says, Whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing. Paul said it's better to marry than to burn. However, if you're not married and you can remain single without living in lust, it would give you more time to spend in the Bible in prayer and in the things of God. But for most people, God's plan is for them to get married. But the fact that Jeremiah doesn't get married makes him a picture of the 144,000 in the tribulation. They are male Jewish virgins. Jeremiah's favorite phrase is, The word of the Lord came. And his name means, Jehovah will cast out. And Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet. This shows manly men cry. Jesus wept. Paul wrote letters stained with tears. Jeremiah is the weeping prophet. To give you an idea of what Jeremiah's ministry was like, look at Jeremiah 1.10. It says, See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out, to pull down, and to destroy, and to throw down, and to build, and to plant. So it's a negative ministry. He roots out, pulls down, destroys, throws down. He says things that aren't like the positive preaching of today. However, he still builds and plants. He's got a balance. For example, Jeremiah mentions backsliding more than any other person in the Bible. What is something a saint doesn't want to be told many times? That they are backslidden. And Jeremiah talks about that word about 13 times. In chapter 1, <clears throat> you're going to see Jeremiah's calling. And the book starts out with, Jeremiah's favorite phrase in Jeremiah 1, 2, To whom the word of the Lord came. The words of God came to Jeremiah just like the words of God will come to you if you open the book. Jeremiah 1, 4, Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. There's your good verse against abortion. The Lord formed Jeremiah in the belly, but before he formed him, he knew him and already had a calling put on him. The Lord is with Jeremiah, and if God be for us, who can be against us? In Jeremiah 1, 18 and 19, For behold, I have made this day a defense city. I have made thee this day a defense city and an iron pillar and brazen walls against the whole land against the kings of Judah against the princes thereof against the priests thereof and against the people of the land and they shall fight against thee but they shall not prevail against thee for I am with thee saith the Lord to deliver thee in chapter 2 you see that Israel has forsaken the God of the Bible they are in apostasy and the Lord wants Jeremiah to preach against Jerusalem in Jeremiah 2.25, 
Withhold thy foot from being unshod, and thy throat from thirst. But thou saidest, There is no hope, nay, or no, for I have loved strangers, and after them will I go. As the thief is ashamed when he is found, so is the house of Israel ashamed, they, their kings, their princes, and their priests, and their prophets, saying to a stock, Thou art my father, and to a stone thou hast brought me forth, for they have turned their back unto me, and not their face, but in the time of their trouble they will say, Arise and save us. Notice that, that Israel are so backslid, they say to a stone, Thou hast brought me forth. They're in some pretty bad shape. And Jeremiah is just preaching hard against them throughout this book. In Jeremiah 3 through 6, you'll see how he exposes the backslidings of the people. In chapters 3 through 5 alone, he says backslidings like seven times. Backsliding is when you're living for the Lord and you cool down for the Lord in any way. Even if you're just not living like a complete devil, you could still be backslid. Uh, you may be living like a Christian, reading your Bible one week, and then the next week you're stuck playing a video game more than reading your Bible. That's backsliding. In chapter 5, you see a description of Jerusalem's unrepentant heart. In Jeremiah 5.3, it says, O Lord, are not thine eyes upon the truth? Thou hast stricken them, but they have not grieved. Thou hast consumed them, but they have refused to receive correction. They have made their faces harder than a rock. They have refused to return. That's a bad shape to get in to when you're living wrong and you don't care. And even though the Lord is chastening you and whipping you, you've become so hard that it's not even phasing you and you're just living your life how you want. That's a dangerous shape to be in. In Jeremiah chapter 7, you see a description of evil in the land. In chapter 7 and verse 6, it shows us how the people are shedding innocent blood and walking after other gods. False gods love the shedding of innocent blood. The Lord willingly shed his innocent blood for us. False gods wouldn't do that and can't do that because they can't see, hear, or walk. But the devil wouldn't shed his blood for us. Jeremiah 7, 8, Behold, you trust in lying words that cannot profit. What are you trusting in? These people trusted in false prophets and positive preachers and the false gods that they were teaching about. Recently, a young woman I knew died and some charismatic nut preacher told the woman's husband that she was going to live and that he could see her holding her grandchildren's grandchildren. He gave the young man false hope through lying words that didn't profit anybody except for the man who told it, until they found out he was full of nonsense when the young woman passed away. You know what that makes that preacher? He makes him a false prophet. Nothing he said ever came to pass the husband's wife died yeah uh, that his kids don't have a mother anymore she's not going to be holding her grandchildren's grandchildren it just i, I was blew, blown away by him telling her husband that she's going to live and hold her grandchildren like like he really could see that in the future there see that's you can cause someone to just lose all faith in God by saying things like that. That guy was a nut. So don't trust in lying words. Jeremiah 7, 9, and 10 says, Will ye still murder and commit adultery and swear falsely and burn incense unto Baal and walk after other gods whom ye know not and come and stand before me in this house which is called by my name and say, we are delivered to do all these abominations. Are you going to stand in front of God and pretend all the filthy stuff that you're doing is just fine? That's what they were doing. 
In Jeremiah 7, 23 and 24, it says, But this thing commanded I them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and ye shall be my people. And walk ye in all the ways that I have commanded you, that it may be well unto you. But they hearkened not, nor inclined their ear, but walked in the counsels and in the imagination of their evil heart, and went backward and not forward. If you're not getting up reading your Bible, praying, staying in fellowship with the Lord, trying to do right, maybe get a ministry or something to keep you living for God, you're going to go backward and not forward. Jeremiah 7, 25, Since the day your fathers came forth of the land of Egypt, and to this day I have even sent unto you all my servants, the prophets, daily rising up early and sending them. So the Lord had prophets coming to preach to them, preaching against their sin, telling them to get rid of their false gods, and they still did not listen. They became hard as a rock. When you can sit and listen to some preachers out there that have very fiery, scary sermons, and it doesn't even faze you, you're getting harder and harder and harder. In chapters 4 through 9, you can really see how Israel has fallen away from the Lord. The preachers and the people were doing very wickedly. In Jeremiah 8.10 it says, Therefore will I give their wives unto others and their fields to them that shall inherit them. For every one from the least even unto the greatest is given to covetousness. From the prophet even unto the priest every one dealeth falsely. For they have healed the herd of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Watch out for all these people always talking about peace and the, saying everything's okay when it's not okay. Jeremiah eight seventeen. For behold, I will send serpents, cockatrices among you, which shall not be charmed, and they shall bite you, saith the Lord. That's chastening. Uh, your wickedness, if you're saved, your wickedness isn't going to go unpunished. You're not going to pay for it in eternity but you'll pay for it here. Jeremiah 9, 14, But have walked after the imagination of their own heart and after Balaam, which their fathers taught them. While their fathers taught them about the false god, Balaam. So what are you teaching your kids? Are you teaching them that video games are God? That celebrities are God? TV shows? What are you teaching the kids? Chapter 10, Jeremiah 10, 1. Hear ye the word of the Lord, which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. So the Lord, the word you had in your hand is God speaking to you. The Lord gave you this book. And many people would love to talk to their favorite athletes, favorite singers, favorite preachers. But did you know God himself speaks to you and gives you 24-7 access to him? And you can talk to him anytime. And he can talk to you through his word any time. So hear ye the word of the Lord. Hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh unto you. In chapter 10 you're going to see a description of something that looks like a Christmas tree. In Jeremiah 10, 3 through 5 it says, For the customs of the people are vain, for one cutteth a tree out of the forest. The work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. They deck it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers that it move not. They are upright as the palm tree and speak not. They must needs be born because they cannot go. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil. Neither also is it in them to do good. So these verses definitely remind us of a Christmas tree. And many men teach against having a tree, a Christmas tree, entirely. Because of these verses. And I actually greatly admire and respect them for their stance. At the same time though it says. Be not afraid of them for they cannot do evil. Neither also is it in them to do good. A Christmas tree is nothing. It's nothing. I don't think it's wrong to have one. I don't think it's wrong to not have one. Um, I don't think it's wrong to have one unless you're worshipping it. And I don't know anybody that worships a tree personally. 
I mean, you put it up as like a family activity and then it sits there for a month and a half and you don't even think about it again. It just It's just in the way and it's hard to get out of the attic. I mean, I'm not against having a tree. I'm not against those who take a stance against it. I admire their stance against the Christmas tree. It's it's just not that big of a deal to me. Jeremiah knows the true nature of God. And Jeremiah 10, 10, it says, But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and an everlasting King. At His wrath the earth shall tremble, and the nations shall not be able to abide His indignation. The Lord is the true God in the midst of a bunch of fake gods. He is the living God. Jesus Christ was dead, but is alive forevermore. He is the everlasting king, and he will sit down on a throne on this earth in the millennial kingdom. And that's when things are going to be so much better. You won't have to worry about all the wicked stuff going on today. When Jesus Christ sits down on the throne as the everlasting king. Jeremiah ten eleven. Thus shall you say unto them, The gods that have not made the heavens and the earth, even they shall perish from the earth and from under these heavens. So all the gods are nothing more than the creatures. People are worshiping and serving the creature more than the creator. And they're going to perish from the earth and from under these heavens. In the millennial kingdom, you're not going to have to worry about false gods. You're not going to have to worry about the unclean spirits because in Zechariah, I believe, it says he made the unclean spirits to pass out of the land in the millennium, that is. The devil is going to be bound a thousand years and people are going to come to worship Jesus Christ or else. Jeremiah 10, 12, and 13, He hath made the earth by his power, he hath established the world by his wisdom, and hath stretched out the heavens by his discretion. When he uttereth his voice, there is a multitude of waters in the heavens, and he causeth the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He maketh lightnings with rain, and bringeth forth the wind out of his treasures. So Jeremiah has the correct view of God. He isn't just some soft grandpa in the clouds. The Lord, that is. Our God is a consuming fire. And Jeremiah 11 talks about Israel's broken covenant. They broke their agreement with God. Jeremiah eleven thirteen For according to the number of thy cities were thy gods, O Judah, and according to the number of the streets of Jerusalem, have ye set up altars to, to that shameful thing, even altars to burn incense unto Baal. Just like in America today, you see wicked stuff just driving down the streets. There is... So much wicked stuff you see on every street. You see it on the billboards, on the posters in the windows of the stores, walking on the streets, the music playing in the cars next to you at the red light. The whole world lieth in wickedness. In Jeremiah 12, Jeremiah asked God why the wicked men in this world prosper. Jeremiah 12, 1, Righteous art thou, O Lord, when I plead with thee, Yet let me talk with thee of thy judgments. Wherefore did the way of the wicked prosper? Wherefore are all they happy that deal very treacherously? This is a big question people have. Why do the wicked prosper? Why are they allowed to be happy? Why do wicked entertainers have so much money? It's because they live for the world and the God of this world, which is the devil, and he's letting them have the things they desire. They're only getting temporary stuff. They're not getting eternal things. In chapter 13, the Lord has Jeremiah hide his uh, girdle in the hole of a rock by Euphrates. And after many days, he has Jeremiah go and dig it back up. And Jeremiah finds that it is marred and good for nothing. Jeremiah 13, 10. This evil people which refuse to hear my words, which walk after the imagination of their heart, and walk after other gods to serve them and to worship them, shall even be as this girdle, which is good for nothing. And there are a lot of Christians who have made themselves good for nothing. But the Lord has Jeremiah do things like this as like an illustration for Israel. In chapter 14, you see how God... Judges his people for their wickedness. Famine, pestilence, all come their way. Also the lying prophets. 
God will allow lying prophets to show up as a judgment on people. Why do you think America has some horrible preachers? Creflo Dollar, Joyce Meyer, Kenneth Copeland, all these horrible preachers, liars, crooks, thieves. That's because it's a judgment on a country for rejecting so much good preaching. There's still a lot of good preaching out there, but people reject it. In chapter 14, you see all of these wicked things come on Israel. Jeremiah 14, 14. Then the Lord said unto me, The prophets prophesy lies in my name. I sent them not, neither have I commanded them, neither spake unto them. They prophesy unto you a false vision and divination, and a thing of naught, and the deceit of their heart. And the internet is full of this kind of thing. Many videos are made with the words, I had a vision, or I saw an angel, or the Lord said this to me. The Lord appeared to me in a dream. All these things. But what they say doesn't come to pass. And what they're saying doesn't come from the Bible. They prophesy lies in the name of the Lord. Anytime someone's telling you that they saw something or they got this prophecy, but they didn't get it from the Bible... You can mark it down there lying. You've probably read about Manasseh. At one time, he was the most wicked king of all time. And even though he got right with the Lord, the wickedness he committed before he got right with the Lord had an effect on multitudes of people. And it says in Jeremiah 15, 3 and 4, And I will appoint over them four kinds, saith the Lord, the sword to slay, and the dogs to tear, and the fowls to of the heaven and the beasts of the earth to devour and to destroy. And I will cause them to be removed into all kingdoms of the earth because of Manasseh, the son of Hezekiah, king of Judah, for that which he did in Jerusalem. Manasseh, that wicked king. The wickedness he committed before he got right with the Lord had an effect on tons of people. I think about that today. How many people did I mess up before I got right with the Lord? How many people did you mess up before you got right? How much did I do as a lost person that is still having an effect today, even in my life? Notice in chapter 16 that Jeremiah is just preaching what God gave him, and here's what he says in Jeremiah 16, 4. They shall die of grievous deaths. They shall not be lamented, neither shall they be buried, but they shall be as dung upon the face of all the earth. And they shall be consumed by the sword and by famine, and their carcasses shall be meat for the fowls of heaven and for the beasts of the earth. What a message. Look at the words he's using. Death, lament, buried, dung, consumed, famine, carcasses for meat. Can you imagine if Jeremiah was here today? They wouldn't have books written by him at the average Christian bookstore. People can't stand negative preaching. Even the average Babylonist only wants to hear God is for you. He has good plans for you. He caresses you and snuggles you and kisses you. God does love you, but God also is a God of wrath. Jeremiah 17, 5 said, Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh his flesh his arm, whose heart departeth from the Lord. Do you know how much you trust in man, even more than you trust in God? You won't step out by faith and do what God wants you to do, but you'll get in a man-made roller coaster that takes you up really high in the air at high speeds. You're trusting in man's hands to do that, but you won't trust in the arm of God. Go through your day and think about all the times that you're trusting something the hands of man did, and yet how you tr won't trust the arm of the Lord. But Jeremiah 17, 7 says, Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, and whose hope the Lord is. Jeremiah 17, 9, The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And there is a quote from a movie I used to watch as a kid where Babe Ruth appears to a kid in a dream and says, Follow your heart, and you'll never go wrong. But that's the worst advice anybody can give. Because your heart is wicked above all things, it'll tell you to do all kinds of crazy stuff. Jeremiah 18 shows you the sign of the potter's house. The Lord explains how he is the potter, the people are the clay, they are in his hands. 
He could make them into something beautiful or just throw them away. He's in control. In Jeremiah chapter 19, Jeremiah was told to show the sign of the potter's earthen bottle. He was told to go break it in front of the people and explain how the Lord could break them like a potter's vessel. God made you. He can break you. In Jeremiah 20, you see Jeremiah's persecution. Pasher puts Jeremiah in the stocks. He persecutes Jeremiah just like it will happen to you if you're saved and standing up for the word of God and someone in this world will get offended. Jeremiah continues to preach negative words of the Lord that Pasher doesn't like. Jeremiah even gets frustrated with the reproach that comes from being a saint of God. However, he can't stop preaching. In Jeremiah 27 through 9, it says, O Lord, thou hast deceived me, and I was deceived. Thou art stronger than I, and hast prevailed. I am in derision daily. Everyone mocketh me. For since I spoke, I cried out, I cried violence and spoil, because the word of the Lord was made a reproach unto me, and a derision daily. Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in mine heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. Once the word of God gets in you, it's like it is part of your very being, and you just can't get away from it. Everything reminds you of the words of God, and your mindset is completely ruined to this world because the Bible has completely changed your mindset so you don't enjoy the things of the world. You're, sometimes Christians get sick of the persecution or living like a Christian. They want to live for the world, but they can't even enjoy the world because they know the world is fake and they know that the world is wicked and doesn't care about anything but itself and they know that the Bible is true. In chapters 21 through 29, you have prophecies Jeremiah gives during the reign of Zedekiah, a wicked king. In chapter 21, Jeremiah answers the wicked king's questions. 1 Peter 3.15 talks about how we should be ready to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that's in you. And Jeremiah could do that. It was like Bob Alexander's question and answer sessions. He could give you the answer within a few seconds with verses to back it. Jeremiah was a Bible man. That's why I was always saying the word of the Lord came. Jeremiah's answer to Zedekiah, of course, was not a delightful thing. It was negative. It was judgment against him. Jeremiah was a negative preacher and did not cut corners even for the king. In chapter 21, what the Lord shows Jeremiah is that Jeremiah will fall to King Nebuchadnezzar. And in Jeremiah 22, Jeremiah prophesies about the kingdom of heaven leaving Israel. In Jeremiah 22, 28 through 30, it says, Is this man Coniah a despised broken idol? Is he a vessel wherein is no pleasure? Wherefore are they cast out, he and his seed, and are cast into a land which they know not? O earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Write ye this man childless, a man that shall not prosper in his days. For no man of his seed shall prosper, sitting upon the throne of David, and ruling any more in Judah. So Jeremiah was so wicked, or Jeconiah, not Jeremiah. Jeconiah was so wicked that the Lord took the J-E off the front of his name. He didn't want it being like Jehovah. He took the J-E off. And nobody after Jeconiah in his line would prosper sitting on the throne of David except Jesus Christ. But that's what made it the much more of a need for the virgin birth. Jesus was in the line of David, but Jesus didn't have an earthly father. So that's why he's king. That's why he prospers as king. Because he had a virgin birth. Jeremiah 23, 16 says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Hearken not unto the words of the prophets that prophesy unto you. They make you vain. They speak a vision of their own heart and not out of the mouth of the Lord. Now doesn't that remind you of many so-called pastors today? Everything they say seems to be from their own heart. There isn't much of the word of God in any of what they're saying. They prophesy false things in the name of Jesus. In chapter 24, you have the great parable of the two baskets of figs. The good figs 
those carried captive to Judah that were sin in the land for the Chaldean in the Chaldeans, they will get blessings from the Lord. The evil figs, Zedekiah and the like, will get judgment from God. Jeremiah 25, 4 says, And the Lord hath sent unto you all his servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them. But ye have not hearkened, nor inclined your ear to hear. That is just like people today. The Lord has preachers all over the place, all over the internet. People step over the preachers on their way to hell. Look at the trending on YouTube. You don't see preaching on there. You don't see anything about the Word of God on there. It's about wickedness on that trending mostly. What's the newest, latest wicked music video? That's at the top. In chapter 25, you also have the 70 year of captivity prophesied. Jeremiah 25, 11 and 12 says, And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. And it shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished that I will punish the king of Babylon. And that nation saith the Lord for their iniquity in the land of the Chaldeans and will make it perpetual desolations. In Jeremiah 26, 7 through 8, Jeremiah spoke so much truth when he proclaimed the words of the Lord that the priests and the prophets wanted him dead. All of the great preachers of today taking a stand have people who want them dead. There are men today take a great stand. Men like Greg Locke, Danny Castle, Stephen Anderson, Sam Gibb, Phil Kidd. And, they are, and, and people want them dead. People want these men dead. And they're glad men like Peter Ruckman are dead and Sammy Allen. They're glad Sammy Allen passed away. Some people probably rejoiced over that. Because they don't like the truth of the words. In chapter 27, you see the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar and the parable of bonds and yokes. In Jeremiah 32, it talks about how King Zedekiah locks up Jeremiah in prison for prophesying against him. Talk about not being able to take preaching. If you're going to put somebody in jail over it. Uh, some people just don't like hard preaching from men like old school Phil Kidd or Ruckman or Danny Castle or Donnie Dalton or some of these rougher preachers. They just can't handle it. They can't handle Jeremiah. Zedekiah wanted him to speak smooth things. Jeremiah 33, 2 and 3, Thus saith the Lord, the maker thereof, the Lord that formed it, to establish it, the Lord is his name. Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Do you ever stop and think about what all God knows about? He knows all about what's outside of the earth. He created it. He knows what's in the bottoms of the oceans. He knows what is going on behind closed doors. He knows what's in the heart. Jeremiah 36, 4, Then Jeremiah called Baruch, the son of Neriah. And Baruch wrote from the mouth of Jeremiah the word to the Lord, which he had spoken unto him upon a roll of a book. And this matches 2 Peter 1, 21, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Jeremiah didn't write at that time, but he spake, and uh, Baruch wrote what Jeremiah spoke. Just like many times Paul spoke, and someone else wrote it for him. Jeremiah 36, 5 through 6. And Jeremiah commanded Baruch, saying, I am shut up. I cannot go into the house of the Lord. Therefore go thou and read in the roll, which thou hast written from my mouth, the words of the Lord in the ears of the people, and the Lord's house upon the fasting day. And also thou shalt read them in the ears of all Judah that came out of their cities. You know how sometimes a preacher may hear another preacher's sermon and use what that preacher said to preach at his church? I don't see anything wrong with that. Jeremiah told Baruch to read what he had written from Jeremiah's mouth. Somebody use your outline or illustrations, then that should be a compliment. In Jeremiah 37, you have Jeremiah going to prison yet again. It says while he is in the dungeon, Zedekiah comes to get him out to ask him a question secretly. I love that he secretly asks him. 
It says, And the king asked him secretly in his house and said, Is there any word from the Lord? Many times the wisest people are the biggest outcasts. Many times the person who have the greatest things to tell you are the ones people are afraid to be associated with. It reminds me of many preachers. They are scared to death to be associated with another preacher, even though that preacher is the one that's full of knowledge, that's telling them what the Bible is talking about, that's telling them all types of great wisdom, yet they're afraid to be associated with that person. They're afraid of what their friends might think. Who cares what they think? I like what Phil Kidd said one time. He said, no Baptist Pope is going to tell me who I can and can't be friends with. It's crazy to let people tell you who you can like or who you can't like. In Jeremiah 38, you see Jeremiah in the dungeon sunk down in the mire, and one of his only friends, ebed Melek, saves him. In chapter 39, Nebuchadnezzar besieged Jerusalem. He kills Zedekiah's son right in front of his eyes and then cuts out Zedekiah's eyes so that the last thing he sees is his sons being slaughtered. In chapters 43 and onward, you have prophecies during Jeremiah's last days. And Jeremiah handled the word of God like it is precious. He didn't cut corners for anybody. It says in Jeremiah 43, 1, it came to pass that when Jeremiah had made an end of speaking unto all the people, all the words of their God, for which the Lord their God had sent him to them, even all these words. He gave all the words. In Acts 20, 27, Paul said he hadn't shunned to declare unto them the whole counsel of God. There shouldn't be any part of this Bible that you couldn't sit down and talk to somebody about. There isn't any part that you should be ashamed of. But to close out in Jeremiah 51 through 52, you have fulfillment of the prophesied destruction of Jerusalem. Jeremiah has proven to be a real prophet and not just someone giving dreams and visions from his own mind. But it's, this is a great book. Jeremiah is a great book. has tons of interesting things in it. And I hope this has whetted your appetite for the book, made you want to read it. Just go through it for yourself. Make your own little overview of the book. It'll help you learn it.